Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again today. Welcome to Worship and the Word with us here at Church of the True Vine. I pray that God would bless you today as we spend this time together. I'm going to begin this morning by reading Psalm 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. What a truly wonderful God we serve. A God who, though he is mighty, though he is the one who has all authority, the one who created the heavens and the earth by the word of his mouth and who sustains all things by the word of his power, who is worshipped by angels and archangels. And yet he intervenes in human life. He is not above us in that sense. He comes and he intervenes in our lives when we call upon his name to such an extent that he did not leave us in the depths of our sin. But he came, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us in the form of the man, Jesus Christ, fully God and yet fully man, and came and humbled himself, not only to living as a man, but to laying down his life for us on the cross. He truly is wonderful. We're going to be praying later together this morning. We're going to be praying for the nation of Maldives and particularly for Christians in Maldives. Most of us think of Maldives as a beautiful holiday location and yet Maldives is currently rated as the 15th most dangerous place in the world for Christians to live. And I'm going to read to you very briefly from the World Watch List booklet issued by Open Doors regarding what life is like for Christians in the Maldives. The government of the Maldives takes pride in the country being 100% Sunni Muslim. Christian converts have to follow Jesus in the greatest secrecy. If discovered, they will be reported to Muslim leaders or the authorities and can be stripped of their citizenship. Everybody must wear Islamic dress and observe Ramadan or face being harassed and arrested. In some areas, violent Islamic extremists are a threat. Even foreign Christians working in tourism are closely watched. If they worship publicly or discuss their faith with a local, they can be deported or even imprisoned. Please join with us later this morning as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Maldives. And please join with us as we pray continuing this awful war that continues in Ukraine. But now let's turn our attention to worshipping this great, this mighty God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This God who has not abandoned us, this God who cares about us so much that he came and entered into this world of darkness, came as the light of the world and laid down his life for us. We're going to sing a beautiful, beautiful worship song this morning. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes. Let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. God bless you 
as we worship the Lord together today. reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places and they came to him from every direction there are many many things i could say regarding this account in mark's gospel it's one of my favorite 
passage of the scripture. Anybody who knows me knows that I love speaking from this passage of scripture. But it's particularly verse 41 that I want to concentrate on today. Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Why do I want to focus on this verse today? The reason I want to focus on this verse today is because when you look at it, when you look at it according to the law of Moses, this is all the wrong way around. You would imagine that Jesus would say, first of all, I am willing, be cleansed. And then when the man was cleansed, Jesus would reach out his hands and embrace the man or whatever it is as the man was made clean. But what we see here is Jesus reaching out his hand to a man who, according to the law of Moses, is unclean, who has a awful disease that is highly contagious. Jesus reaches out his hand and touches the man and then says, I am willing be clean. The thing about leprosy is that leprosy is something in the Bible which shows us in a physical way something that is going on in the spiritual realm. If somebody had leprosy, they were cast out from society. They were not allowed to approach other people. They had to wear special clothing when they went anywhere near where people were. They had to shout out, unclean, unclean, so that nobody would have contact with them. But the thing about leprosy is this, that leprosy as a disease can be in somebody's body without there being any external signs to begin with. When somebody contracts leprosy, it takes a while for those symptoms, for those signs to appear in their body. You could say, if you like, that the, the sores and all of the other things and the, and the, the loss of um, um, sensation in limbs and eventually the loss of fingers and toes, even noses and other parts of the body, those could be said to be the fruit of leprosy in somebody's body. Leprosy is a type of what we know as sin. The Bible is quite clear. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you look at a lot of people and you think, yeah, but they're good people. They're nice people. They're helpful people. They're kind people. They're loving people. And yet this disease of sin is in everybody's life. You might say, well, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a, a, a wife beater. I've never abused anybody. I've never lied. I've never cheated. I've always paid my taxes to the full and on time. I'm not a sinner. Well, the Bible is quite clear. All have sinned. It's just that some people are displaying more fruit from that sin than others. And Jesus is here with this man who is unclean. You see, leprosy separated people from other people. If you had leprosy, you were cast out from society. You were not allowed to go near where clean people were. And sin separates us from God. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 59, it tells us here in this scripture what iniquity, that is another word for sin, does. Isaiah 59, beginning at verse 1, says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Iniquity, sin, separates us from God. Why? Because spiritually, we are unclean. In Earlier on in Isaiah, in chapter 6, Isaiah has a vision of God. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 4 says, The posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, 
for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. In both of these examples, in Mark 1 and in Isaiah chapter 6, we see someone who is unclean and we see somebody who is unable to do anything about their uncleanness. Isaiah said, woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips. He recognized in that moment there was nothing he could do. And here he was in the presence of a holy God. No wonder he cried out, woe is me. There was nothing Isaiah could do to clean himself. In the same way, this leper, once he had contracted that disease, there was nothing that he could do to make himself clean. That's why he came to Jesus and begged Jesus if he was willing to make him clean. Jesus could have said, I am willing. The leper could have sat there, knelt there, thinking, is he? Is he really? Is he really willing? You see, that question is not answered simply by speaking the words. There has to be a demonstration of the truth of those words. When we come to God and we say, Lord, I am unclean. When we recognize that we are sinners, we have to recognize we cannot save ourselves from our sin. And God could say, that's great. I forgive you. But where's the proof? Where's the demonstration? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God does not leave us guessing. Praise God for Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, which tells us this. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God could say to us, I'm willing to forgive you of your sin. I am going to tell you that I love you. I'm going to tell you all of these wonderful things. But where is the proof? Where is the demonstration? This leper had not known human contact for we don't know how long. He needed a demonstration in order to be able to receive that statement. When Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, he was demonstrating not only his compassion, he was demonstrating his authority over that sickness because in touching that leper Jesus did not contract leprosy himself. When you come to Jesus as a sinner Jesus doesn't become unholy but instead he touches you with his holiness with his authority and he declares these words I am willing be cleansed. Now the truth of the matter is that it was impossible for us to cleanse ourselves. It was impossible for us to get ourselves free from sin. We simply could not do it. And religions for centuries have tried. People have tried religious rituals, religious ceremonies, religious ways of life. They've tried hard to be good. They've tried to live holy lives. But the truth of God's word declares that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We cannot attain that standard of holy perfection which God demands from us to enter into his presence. Why? Because sin will not be tolerated in the kingdom of heaven. Sin is like a disease. Once it gets in, it spreads and it multiplies. God will not allow sin into the kingdom of heaven. Because if he did, then heaven would very soon be worse than hell because it would go on forever.
All the lying, all the cheating, all the hatred, all the murder, all the rape, all the adultery. It would devastate eternity. God says there is a standard and that standard is holy perfection. It's impossible for us to reach that standard. God gave Moses a law. We know the Ten Commandments. You only have to look at the first one of those. Let's just turn, if you like. Well, actually, no. Look, Jesus said that the greatest commandment is this. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, to keep God's law of holy perfection... You have to maintain that command 100% of every second, every minute, every day, every week, every month, every year of your life from, the, from beginning to end. It's impossible for us to do. But why did, why did God make these laws? Why did God do that? God didn't give us the law to condemn us. God gave us the law to show us that it was impossible to live up to the standard, that our sins truly had separated us from God because we fall short of that holy standard of perfection. Listen, before the law came, sin was in the world and death reigned through sin. Sin was already in the world. God gave the law to show us the full extent of our sin. But the law was not given to condemn us. If you turn to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, let's just turn there very, very briefly. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24 says, Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. The law was there to show us our desperate need of a saviour. A saviour which God promised right from the word go. God promised in Genesis chapter 3 that when man sinned, he was still going to put things right. He was still going to make a way. He was still going to make things happen. If you just turn to Genesis chapter 3. And verse, um, verse uh, 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 14, God, first of all, speaks to the serpent who deceived Adam and Eve. He says, because you have done this, you are cursed more than cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God promises that one is coming who is going to crush Satan's head. God promises that there is a saviour coming. God is saying to the, the man and the woman, I'm not forgetting you. I'm not going to write you off. And we can look at those words and we can say, well, that's all very well, God, but what are you going to do about it? Anybody can say, I love you. Anybody can say, I will always be there for you. Anybody can say, don't you worry, I'm going to get you out of this mess. But the proof of the pudding has to be in the eating. We were unclean, unfit to approach a holy good, certainly unfit to enter in to a heavenly kingdom where there is no sin, where everything is glorious and righteous and pure and holy. We had no right we were separated from God, from the kingdom of God. Our iniquities had separated us from God. We were unclean. God could have sent prophets to say, I love you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to make you clean. But where's the proof? The proof is found on the cross of Calvary. As God, who became flesh, Jesus Christ went to the cross for us, laid down his life for us, became sin for us. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 21 tells us God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us so that in him 
we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't just say to the leper, I'm willing, be clean. You're just going to have to take my word for it. Jesus demonstrated his willingness to cleanse the leper in touching him. When Isaiah cried out, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. The cherub, the, the cherub came from the altar with those burning coals and touched his lips and then said, you are clean. God touches us first. God knows it's impossible for us to make ourselves clean. Jesus knew it was impossible for the leper to make himself clean. But he touched him first and then said, I am willing, be clean. No matter how much we try to clean ourselves up, we're not going to make ourselves acceptable to God. We're not going to make ourselves touchable by our own efforts. We have to come, fall on our knees before Jesus Christ and say, if you are willing, you can make me clean. When we do that, Jesus is always able, but he's always willing. He's demonstrated that willingness, not just with words, but with his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. It is only through the blood of Jesus that we are made clean. Forget religious ritual, forget trying hard. You have to come by faith in Jesus Christ and receive his touch. That touch that can make you clean because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you have promised us we may ask anything in the name of Jesus and it will be done. Father, we come today on behalf of our brothers and sisters in the Maldives. Father, you know their situation. You know how hard it is for them to declare their faith publicly. You know the penalties that they face if they are caught worshipping or mingling with other believers. Lord, I pray first of all that you would keep my brothers and sisters safe. I pray, Lord, that you would enable them to find ways of being able to meet with other Christians in that nation. I pray that they would be able to find times and places where they can meet together, even if it's two individuals. But Lord, I pray they would be able to meet together to encourage one another, to strengthen one another in their faith. I pray that Holy Spirit, you would bless those meetings, that you would anoint the word as they speak it to one another and that they would truly be built up in their faith. Father, we pray for any that are already in prison. Lord, we pray that you would help them and sustain them, give them courage, give them help in what they're enduring. And Lord, even in those places of imprisonment, Lord, may they be a shining light as the Holy Spirit works in their words, works in their deeds, works in their approach to other prisoners and to those who imprison them. May they know your love. May they know your peace. May they know your presence with them always. And Lord, we pray that you would bring about changes in policy in that nation that religious freedom would become the norm in that land rather than things as they are today lord we pray that you would change the hearts of the leaders we pray for any who would seek to betray christians lord we pray that you would soften their hearts and that they would come to know jesus for themselves as their lord and their savior Father, we pray too regarding this war in Ukraine. Father, all we see on the news is devastation. We see lives lost. We see terrible images. And Lord, it's hard to imagine that scale of war here in the United Kingdom where we live lives in safety 
without worrying about whether we're going to be bombed at night or whether drone strikes are going to happen, whether we'll wake up tomorrow morning or not. Lord, we pray for that nation, that you would bring peace, that you would cause this war to come to an end. Lord, that you would spare innocent lives. We pray that you would perform miracles in that land, that bullets would miss their mark, that bombs would fail to explode, that lives would be saved where it seemed as though it was impossible for lives to be saved. Lord, we ask you to intervene. Lord, we ask you to bring this war to an end. And I pray especially for churches and for ministries in that nation, that they would be a true light in that darkness. I pray that you would help them as they seek to help others, as they seek to be a blessing to the people around them, to bring support, to bring strength, to bring love and compassion into those lives that have been torn apart by this war. Help them, Lord, to bring your love and the gospel message, which is truly what all men need, but it's what Ukraine and Russia need right now. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would enable this to happen. And we pray more than anything that you would bring this war to a speedy end and an end where righteousness and truth is seen to prevail, that evil is not seen to prosper. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today. It's been wonderful sharing this time with you. Just one more thing I want to say before we come to an end today. And that is, if you do not know Jesus, if you do not know that your sins are forgiven, if you do not know that if you were to die today, that you would be with God forever, then today is an opportunity for you to come to Christ to receive the forgiveness of your sins and to enter in by the Spirit of God into a relationship with God as your heavenly Father to be saved from sin, to be saved from condemnation and to receive the gift of everlasting life. In order for that to happen, first of all, you need to understand something. That is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that whether you like it or not, you are a sinner. And the Bible is very clear. The wages of sin is death. That doesn't simply mean physical death as you come to the end of life on this earth. It means eternal death, which is separation from God the Father in a place called hell, which God did not create for men. But because men rebelled against God and followed the ways of of the devil then that is where they would follow him too unless God had made a way that is why Jesus came Jesus did not come to condemn Jesus did not come to send people to hell Jesus came for one reason and one reason only and that is that through him men women children might be saved from that fate and enter in to a relationship with God, enter into the kingdom of heaven, washed clean from sin. Is that what you are looking for today? If this is you, then first of all, you need to admit to God and to yourself that you are a sinner, that you have, like every other human being, sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard of holiness then you need to call upon Jesus, the one who came to die in your place, to lay down his life so that you can receive through him the gift of everlasting life. You need to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. If you don't believe that, then how can Jesus save you today? But because Jesus is risen from the dead, he is able to save anyone who will call upon him even at this moment in time. And lastly, you must confess Jesus as Lord. That means that you must surrender your life to him, 
Choose to turn away from living life your own way. Choose from going your own way, living a life of sin. You need to come and ask him to forgive you, to wash you clean and to be the one who has the final say in your life. Are you willing to do that today? Do you believe that Jesus died for you and that he is risen from the dead? And are you willing, if need be, to lay down your life for his name's sake? If that's you, then pray with me. This prayer in itself will not save you. It has to happen in your heart. You have to truly, truly mean this and follow Jesus with all your heart from this point onward. If that's you, I'm going to help you by praying this prayer. It's just a way of enabling you to verbally express what is going on in your heart and in your mind right now. Lord Jesus, I confess I am a sinner. I know it's impossible for me to save myself from my sin. I've tried to change my ways in the past and I have failed. I need someone to save me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God who came from heaven and died on the cross in my place, taking the punishment that my sins deserve. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are risen from the dead and that you are able to save me as I call upon your name. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I turn from my own way and I choose to follow you as best as I can from this day forward. I ask you to forgive me my sin, to wash me clean and to fill me with your Holy Spirit to enable me to follow you and not stray from following you. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you right now. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer and truly meant it, Jesus always, always hears a prayer from somebody who truly means it and he will have saved you in that moment. If that's you, then please, please get in touch. Let us know that that is what you've done. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, then I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Please get in touch. Let us know that you have given your life to Christ and we will pray with you or for you. We will do everything we can to encourage you and to help you as you begin this exciting new life as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not always going to be easy. I'm not going to say that to you. That would be a lie. Sometimes it's hard, but you now are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and there is an eternal reward awaiting you if you follow for the rest of your days. So please get in touch so that we can help you and pray for you. If you're anywhere in the Clevedon area, then just come along and join us on a Sunday morning. We meet at the Community Centre on Prince's Road at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. It'd be great to meet with you and to encourage you in whatever way we can. If you're not in the Clevedon area, then please get in touch anyway, and we will help you in whatever way we can. If we can get you in touch with a church local to you, then we will do that. We're back again at the same time on YouTube next week. That's 10 a.m. UK time. So until then, may God bless you. Bye bye.